now you have done the three minute trial, it's time to talk you through the physiology of the pool. So, I'm going to talk to you a bit about what's so critical about the critical power. So sorry for the corny, cheesy title there. Um, one of the reasons why we've got interested in this concept is that, as well as the physiology underlying it, we found it a really useful thing for probably as an applied tool for a coach or for a physiologist or even for an athlete to track their, their fitness and performance over time. So, that's why I suggested we, we look at it. I want to give you a little bit of background first though, just to put it all into context. You've probably come across some of these terms before, but routinely in, in the exercise laboratory we would be measuring things like maximal oxygen uptake, where we'd hook you up to a, a mouthpiece and gas analysis system and we'd measure the max, maximum amount of oxygen that you can take in and use in a minute. So it's not just taking in, it's not the volume of air, but it's the amount of muscle tissue you can actually take in and use. Something else we might look at is um, efficiency or your econ economy. Now, this relates to, again, the amount of oxygen you might consume. But if you imagine two athletes working at 200 watts, both of them would not use the same amount of oxygen for that 200 watts. The athlete that is more economical would use less oxygen. And ultimately, that's a performance advantage because they would be able to produce more watts in their top, top end. Um, even though they might have the same VO2 maxes as, as um, the other people. And then the lactate threshold. <coughs> and this is about how much of that top end can you use and sustain. So these are the things that we would typically measure as exercise physiologists to try and help the, the athlete improve their, their performance. If we look at that last thing, and I know this is a slide that some of you have seen before, um, Performance is really about sustaining a high percentage of your maximum. So you might have a high VO2 max. Someone like Chris Borgen, 550 watts uh, was one of the measurements of his maximum minute power. And that's 90 millilitres of oxygen per kilogram of his body mass per minute. To put that into, into some context, Joe Average would be around 60 mils per kilo. I mean, Joe Average, the athlete, um, Sedentary people would be more likely 35, 40. So it's got a huge ability to use oxygen. He also had a very good ability <coughs> to use a high percentage of his maximum without fatiguing. And reports have shown that Borman could hold 90% of his VO2 max for an hour. About 442 watts is the estimate for his hour record. And most of us couldn't even get there for a minute. <coughs> it shows you phenomenal mm -hmm. So maximal um, ability is very important. And we've got various tests. That take threshold, which is um, where you have a blood lactate increase in a, in a ramp test. So it starts off steady, then you get to a certain power, and the lactate response starts to kick up. Maximal lactate steady state, that is about the intensity you can hold for an hour without fatiguing. And then we've got this critical power concept, which is what we're, we're, we're doing today. But all of them are similar <coughs> in that they measure that ability to utilise a percentage of your maximum. And they're all a, sort of a threshold. The, the problem is, that for people like yourselves to understand, is people talk about threshold, and it means different things to them. Some people it means the first lactate threshold, some people think it's the second threshold, um, which is more like an hour our um, intensity. So it's really, really confusing. So the coach says to go out and train at threshold, you might be training too, too hard or too, too low. But we'll um, talk a little bit more about that at another, another time. Critical power. Critical power concept is talking about the predictable relationship between the power output and the duration. So imagine, the higher the power is, the less time you can hold it. The lower the power, you should be able to hold it for longer. And that's what we'll uh, be looking at today. And what we're doing in the lab is we take a series of trials that last from 2 to 15 minutes. Now what you're doing today is a slight variation because it's often, we, we found it a lot easier for athletes to pace and to get their head round, is if you do time blocks 
because it gives you a clear target. But the way we do it in, um, uh, in the research, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you've been in before, you've done set power output and you go for as long as you can. And those open-ended tests are horrible. Um, I'm not saying the ones you're doing today are pleasant, but it's, it's nice to say, well, I've only got 15 seconds left, rather than, have I got 15 seconds less? left? Oh, I don't know. And, you know, it, it's hard when it's open-ended. Motivation is a, <coughs> is a key thing there. Um, I very often used to test myself um, critical power during the year, always in my time trial position, quite often rigged up to, to look at my maximum oxygen uptakes. That's one thing you can do during the three-minute trials. We often get a good score of, of a, a VO, VO2 max too. Um, but for me, trial one, um, 184 seconds, it's about that three minute mark, and I'll be able to hold at 325 watts. Trial two, it's a longer trial, but now you can see that power output's going down. And by trial three, 280 watts, you can see then that we've got a curve. Interestingly though, it's not linear, it's not a straight line. It might be hard to um, pick out there, but you'll see it's a curve. So what we do with your data we've collected today, we don't just draw a straight line through it, we have to do um, um, some, some curve fitting. Because then what we do, we look at the point at which that curve starts to flatten, <coughs> and that's the critical power value. You might come across a slightly different use of the phrase critical power. And it's unfortunate, again, that people have um, confused the terminology. The real critical power is this prediction of an intensity that you can go at in theory indefinitely. You might see a critical power, a, sort of like a, a three minute critical power. That's how much power can you hold for three minutes, or a critical power for seven minutes. That doesn't make sense. That's actually just the maximum power you can hold for that period of time. But what we're predicting is one value, so each athlete would have one value. So like I say, it's meant to be the intensity that you can sustain indefinitely without fatigue. Um, but the, the research we've done here, um, in practice it's not necessarily true. Um, you certainly can hold um, a 10 mile time trial indefinitely. So if you can, you're not going hard enough. Um, you should talk to someone about your pacing. But it, it's more like 10 mile time trial intensity. So what we find is that people can hold critical power for about 20 to 40 minutes. And of course, you can now perhaps make the link and why I'm so interested in it, because if we can predict where you're at power-wise, we know that that's probably your 10-mile target power, and it's very, very useful then to be able to set training around that intensity. Typically, it's about 85 to 90% of our, of our VO2 max, so it's very high intensity, and you're not going to be able to sustain it for very long. Just to draw your attention to the fact that this is where it lies. Someone like Chris Baldwin can actually hold that for an hour, so he's got real endurance tolerance. <coughs> so here I have just a quick run through of those physiological landmarks, just to give you an idea where physical power lies. Lactate threshold, about 60% of VO2 max. The maximal lactate steady state, that's that one hour intensity, or for those of you that know the concept, functional threshold power, it's about 80%. <coughs> Critical power is above that and between VO2 max. And the useful thing for me as a, as a physiologist and coach is that I can then start to define exercise training zones around those parameters. And this is why we measure as many of these as we can because it really helps us hone in on these points. So zones one and two are below your first lactate threshold. Zones three and four are kind of in the area between lactate threshold and maximum lactate steady state, just encompassing this one hour power area. And then um, zones five and six. Zone five will be around critical power, and zone six anything above it. So it's really useful to, to measure all these landmarks in the lab. So critical power, in other words, it's an intensity where your breathing is hard, so you're not in a steady state. You couldn't carry it on indefinitely. <coughs> you're working hard, you're breathing hard. There's a real feeling that if you kept going, you'd probably start hitting VO2 maximum. Mm -hmm. That feeling of lactic acid is building, you know, you know what it's like at the end of a 10 mile time trial, you just know that there's some damage going on in there. Um, so there's your, your ability to tolerate exercise is definitely limited. So it's not sustainable. 
But what it does tell us on that exercise intensity continuum from 0 to 100% of VO2 max is it tells us when is exercise going to become hard. So exercising <coughs> below critical power versus exercising above critical power, two very different things. And this comes back to the point that um, I was asked earlier about whether 3 minute, 7 minute or 12 minute trials are similar in its physiology. They are in that they're all above critical power, so certain energy systems are similar. similar the, 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 the ones that are used are similar, but the proportions of them might be slightly different. So why is it useful? Well, for me, it's easy to measure. You don't need any specialist kit. Um, okay, you need a power meter, but you can do it with a turbo. Um, we, we, we're not, you don't have to come into the laboratory to have your critical power measured. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's a nice useful tool. You need a way of establishing what your work is, power in the case of cycling, and, and the time. Um, what's quite nice as well, if you haven't got a, a power meter, you can also do it in terms of distance covered. If you're pretty sure that you've got a windless day, um, you could then test yourself and see how much distance can we cover in a certain time. You can, you can plot your, not critical power, but your critical distance, your critical speed, and those kind of things. It's, it's quite easy to understand because, it, it's, um, because it's performance related. The more power, the faster you're going to go. So it, it, it kind of makes sense that um, um, to the athlete, in that it's, it's like doing a 10 mile time trial, you, you know that you've got to push out more power for you to go faster. Whereas things like lactate threshold are quite hard to, to get your head around, um, particularly when people start to think about first and second threshold. And um, I'll say this time in cheek, it doesn't really feel like exercise testing. It feels more like a race. Um, whereas when you've got something in your mouth and someone's taking blood samples from you and you're doing this incremental <coughs> where, uh, test where the intensity is getting harder every few minutes, <coughs> that's very, very kind of alien to most athletes. Whereas this is, at least it's more, more routinely what you can do. And especially these intensities that you'll be doing today, for the three minutes, seven minutes, and the 12 minute trials, it's sort of a training session. Even the stuff you're doing today will give you a training effect. So, um, testing is training, as it has been said. It's quite nice as well that, um, particularly athletes that don't want to disrupt their training program, just because you know, their coach says, right, we need to get them into the lab to measure your fitness. Quite often you then have to have an easy day before you have to kind of compromise your training, or at least that's sometimes the athlete's perspective. So here, you can actually use these blocks, perhaps as part of a training session if you're out on the road or, or doing a turbo session. Some research that we've just finished doing here has also shown it to be a useful training intensity. So by doing intervals around your critical power, we found better improvements in your fitness profile. Um, one of the training sessions that I'm very keen on is five minute blocks at 10 mile race pace and if those of you that um, have been coaching for a while will, will know what those five minute blocks feel like and know that they appear quite regularly in your, in your training diet um, it's because they really do impact very very well on your, on your fitness. We've also found that um, the critical power helps us spot who are good performers um, and who are less performers and um, a study again that we just finished um, for, this is um, data from a group of female time trialists. In fact, some of you in this room are actually in this data. Um, you can see here that generally it's a very good relationship between what your critical power was and your 10 mile race power. So again, it's, it seems to be a pretty good predictor. 